The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. This is episode 184. And my wonderful guest today is a debut novelist, Michael Rose. Michael joins us today to discuss that debut novel, The Sorting Room. It is a wonderful story, uh, deeply personal and uh, deeply moving. It's one that's going to really touch your heart. And I cannot wait to share that with you. But we have a conversation along the way that is touching on all sorts of writing aspects. I mean, we are talking about, you know, being happy with where you are and your choices in life, uh, living with living the dream as a writer. Uh, <laughs> the more you learn as a writer, the more you discover that you don't know is uh, one of the things I took from this and taking different paths in life, how that could lead you in different ways. Yeah, you know, just there's so many, so many wonderful things, uh, including all the really nice things that he says about me. Uh, which I'm going to have to get that check in the mail for Michael here real soon. So that way you, you know, pay him back for all the nice stuff that he says. It, it was really flattering, and I really appreciate it. So, yeah, listen for that, everyone. I am a nice guy. People do like me. And doggone it, I like me too. <laughs> all right, yeah, a little throwback there, some old SNL. Well, you know, but it's a, it's a great conversation, and you're going to really like Michael, and uh, I, I invite you to make sure that you get over and follow his website. The link is in the show notes, and uh, follow him on Amazon as well, so that way you know when his next books are available. Uh, this book, this debut novel, The Sorting Room, pre-order is up right now. You can pre-order that today and then have it as soon as it's available, and uh, yeah, that, that link is also in the show notes. I'm going to go ahead and move things along because this is a longer than usual conversation because we had, basically we had so much fun talking about uh, all, all this uh, writerly stuff. So, you know, yeah, you writers in the crowd, you're going to love this conversation. But meanwhile, uh, check out this ad for our sponsor Scrivener and hear how you can save 20% on the regular desktop version. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing cork board, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener writing software, built by writers for writers. All right, as always, thank you so much to Scrivener. I love being partners with them and uh, hope it's a friendship I can continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, I also want to thank Audible for partnering up with us and making this incredible offer. Hello friends, Jason here, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you about a great offer from Audible. Like you, I'm very busy. I have a full-time job, a family, I'm a thriller author, and I do this weekly podcast. But I also love to read. That's where Audible is a lifesaver for me. Whether I'm mowing the yard, working out, driving back and forth to work, or doing some other menial task, I can still listen to an incredible book through Audible. And now you can get a free 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash sample chapter. By doing that, you'll not only have that 30-day trial, you'll also gain access to guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, A-list comedy, exclusive Audible originals, and even podcasts like the Sample Chapter Podcast. Last year is the first time I ever achieved my own personal reading goals, and it was because of some wonderful titles I listened to on Audible. Some of those titles were Ready Player Two by Ernest Cline, narrated by Will Wheaton, 
the Awaken Online series from Travis Bagwell, narrated by David Stifle. Patient Zero by Jonathan Mayberry, narrated by the incredible Ray Porter. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention previous guest Scott Meyer with his Magic 2.0 series, narrated by Luke Daniels. It's a lot of fun and definitely worth your time. Hey, full disclosure, by signing up at audibletrial.com slash sample chapter, the show does get a little monetization, which goes directly towards any production needs uh, with the show. So you're also helping us out here by signing up. So what are you waiting for? Head on over now to audibletrial.com slash sample chapter and start your free 30-day trial today. Okay, thank you once again to Audible. Uh, moving right along, I want to thank our podcast friends, starting with Pop Goes the Culture Network, home to uh, 10 or 12 different shows, all of them pop culture related. So if you like movie news, TV news, celebrity gossip, all kinds of stuff, you can find a show for you there at the Pop Goes the Culture Network. Click that link in the show notes to find out all those wonderful shows there, including the Sample Chapter podcast. And we are also a part of the Project Entertainment Network, home to a little over 30 incredible shows of a very wide variety. Hey, check out this advertisement for one of those shows on our sister network. You don't have to find an interdimensional saloon to have a pint of alien beer with me, Chrissy Garrison. Just tune into my alien beer podcast each Thursday, and I'll share my speculative fiction stories with you. And every other week, I'll be serving up a new installment in my science fiction serial, The Multiverse Blues. Meanwhile, catch up with me at sillyhatbooks.com slash podcast. See you there. Okay, there we go. Another fantastic show at Project Entertainment Network. As always, click those links in the show notes for all of these podcast friends, our sponsor and partner alike. And uh, don't forget to follow all of them and the Sample Chapter Podcast on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just look up Sample Chapter Podcast in those locations and you will find us. You can also email the show at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com. Or if you would like to call the show, you can do so by calling 660-851-1146 and leave me a voicemail. I will be more than happy to put that on an upcoming episode. All right, everyone. Moving right along. How about we get on over to our interview with Michael Rose and hear all about him and his debut book, The Sorting Room. Hello, listeners all around the world. Welcome back to an exciting new episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. You know, one of the wonderful things about doing this show is getting to meet debut authors. Yes, it's fun to talk to celebrities like Lou Diamond Phillips and uh, Jeff Arch and, you know, just to name a few. But, you know, for me, one of the real fun things is to talk to that debut author, the ones who is this is their first book. And, you know, it's the question that we all have. What do I do now? Now that I got this book and today's guest is one of those debut novelists. Uh, that I cannot wait to dive into. Uh, we've already had a nice little chat ahead of time, and you all are going to love it, and uh, I cannot wait to talk about his book. Our guest is Michael Rose. Michael was raised in a small family dairy farm in upstate New York. Uh, he retired after serving in executive positions for several global multinational enterprises and comes today with his debut novel, The Sorting Room. Uh, Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. It's great to be here. This is exciting. I mean, you've got quite the history of, of work and uh, a background in, in lots of uh, lots of different jobs, it looks like, uh, with the executive directors and some other companies that you've worked in. Um, and then now you're a novelist. What, uh, what, what took you so long? I know we were talking before about delayed gratification. What was, for you, the, the jump from uh, retirement into wanting a novel write? Yeah, it was... Um... It was clearly a case of predetermined delayed gratification. Um, I always wanted to write since I was a young adult, probably later years of college. Um, and I had no idea what that meant. I studied economics. I started as a math major. And um, since I grew up on a farm and I watched my dad go through a huge life change, we milked about 30 cows. 
And we had maybe a herd of 50 to 60 counting heifers and all that. But um, it, was a, it was an interesting family situation because it was my grandpa's farm and my dad was the bonus baby, <laughs> the youngest <laughs> of a group. And so he was destined to run the farm and he did for 20 years. And at 39, he had three little kids. And the um, biggest issue was my grandfather had had a stroke and was in a hospital and had not signed power of attorney over, um, even though my dad had the ability and the will to buy out his siblings at the original purchase price, which was back in the early 1900s. So um, he wanted to save the farm and he had to take my grandfather out of a nursing home and bring him back to the farm and was his nurse without any training. And, and this man, my grandfather was paralyzed down his entire right side, could not speak. So he was uh, in rough shape. He laid like that for 10 years in a nursing home. But the rent from the farmland when my dad got out of farming, first step to save the farm was I can't, you know, at 39, he said, I can't make my finances work like this. I got to go to work outside the farm. So he rented the land. We sold all the um, cows and and all the dairy equipment, tried produce for one year. That didn't work. Uh, it was a bumper crop of sugar beets. So he just had to suck it up and uh, go out and, and uh, put a broom in his hand and get to work. So I watched this. And as I thought about writing, and it was just a dream, I'm sure you know everybody uh, that would listen to this kind of podcast, yourself included, Jason, you have this dream to, to write. It's a wonderful dream. But uh, until you roll up your sleeves, it's a lovely dream. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I can do this. And every time you read a book, I go, oh, that's interesting. And you have a thought. Um, and I heard about a, um, a contest that I can't remember the specifics. So I'll butcher this. Forgive me. But, do you know, William Kennedy, the, the author of the Albany series, he wrote Iron Weed, which is a movie you might have seen. With OK. Yeah. You and all the, the guy is brilliant. And he was from uh, the Albany, New York area, a few hours away from where I grew up in, in uh, Finger Lakes region. And he won a contest and the, or he didn't win a contest. He was granted an award. This is after several fantastic, well-reviewed novels, well-received novels. And the idea was to give him enough money so that he could write uninterrupted without having to teach and edit or do a side job, anything else for like three years. I forget how much it was, but it was, 35,000 or 65, something like that. I thought, you can't put kids through college. You can't get them working. <laughs> you can't, you know, I, I can't. I, and I thought, this guy's already accomplished. And I realized what my dad had gone through um, with facing financial troubles and doing all the things he had to do. Um, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't countenance uh, going off and being a starving artist when I wanted to start a family. I wanted to um, you know, help my own family, all that good stuff that, you know, that, that you think is a young person. And so I sort of delayed gratification. And of course, that's easy because you think, oh, I'll do it someday. I'll do it someday. I'll do it someday. And when I dipped into it the first time, I had gotten promoted at work. All the computers were at work. This was in the 80s. And um, my wife and I talked and she knew I wanted to write. So I, I said, can I um, hang out there Wednesday nights and just write one, one night a week? And that lasted four weeks <laughs> because I only had two speeds work in my family. And I worked really hard. I guess it was because I was a farm boy and I got a great opportunity in a big company. It was Hewlett Packard at the time. And I was competing against people with just great degrees and pedigrees. And I actually started as a clerk. And so I was, I was just working my tail off doing the farm boy thing. And I realized I, this isn't good for my marriage or, being a dad or anything else. So I just kicked the can way down the road. And um, when I first retired, um, I was, uh, let's see, I guess I was 52, just a day before my 53rd birthday. And right after that, I threw, I was in semi-retirement. I threw myself into pursuit of writing. I considered myself a writing student because I didn't know anything. But what I did was I wrote four novels back to back, boom, 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 boom. And of course, they were all terrible. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I, I didn't know what I was doing. And but my my sense was I had delayed gratification for so long. I wanted to at least taste what I thought was the writing life, which mm -hmm. was solitary experience of conceptualizing, plotting it out, uh, maybe doing a little of the panster things, which is a term that I learned much later. 
Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to experience that. And, and so my own mental trick was, Hey, if I don't know, I stink, I can still enjoy this experience. And then, uh, when I get some real feedback, I can decide whether, um, you know, I should pursue the craft or, um, I should just say that was a cool experience. I tried writing and I'm, I'm not very good at it. So that's what I did. And that was probably really silly. But because uh, I spent a few years doing that. And then when I finally got uh, my words in front of people that could actually tell me something other than my friends who I had one guy who's an English teacher and goes, this is great. And I thought, I'm there. You know, I've made it. It's an English teacher. So <laughs> I'm there. And of course, I was nowhere near there. And he was being a nice guy and encouraging me because he's a wonderful man. And as a result, I go 180 degrees out of phase, just tooling along the wrong road thinking, I got this, I got this. And then when I finally confronted my incompetence and became consciously incompetent, that's when my real learning started. Mm. And um, it, was, uh, it was good because I don't think, I, if I knew what I didn't know, that conscious incompetence, that first step in learning, where you go, wow, this is what I don't know. Like you, you, you're a bass fisherman. You know, if you didn't know how to cast, <laughs> you better learn that first, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta figure out. So it was, I had no craft. I had been at work, a really good writer of business uh, uh, things like business plans or just communications, what have you. And so I got this, all these false positives. I can do this. I can do this. And the reality of it is I could do it if I learned the craft. I did not know the craft. So I went on a very uh, long pursuit, both with some outside help. I hired um, a teacher to help me page by page. A uh, guy I've never met in person. He's a He's in upstate Massachusetts, wonderful guy, taught hmm. me a ton. And, um, and then I, every morning I would get up and I'd read about writing. Uh, I'd read the books, uh, you know, one of the, my favorite, you had mentioned Stephen King in one of your other podcasts. Hmm. And hmm. I, I didn't pour, it just freaks me out. So I don't read that stuff. <laughs> um, you know, I just have, I think too fruit, uh, fertile an imagination. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't read Stephen King but I read his book on writing and it's one of my favorite books on writing by uh, the one by Stephen. Oh yeah. Oh, it's just fantastic. It really so is. So I did that kind of stuff. And as I was doing, I realized I really don't know what I'm doing. So anyway, that's how I got started on the journey. I'll stop. I'm just babbling. I think. <laughs> no, I mean, you've got, Oh my gosh, so many wonderful points. I'm like, I'm like taking down notes here and there. And it's like, man, where do we start from there? Cause there's so much good stuff you talked about. Um, I, I can definitely relate then. I mean, that's one of the things you and I have in common uh, with your dad is that the, the thing we've always done is that we've always kind of, well, you know, we've got to put bread on the table. We've got to take care of the family. And whether that's picking up a second job, which I did for a while, or, you know, doing whatever, doing whatever is necessary and delaying our own dreams, our own gratification for whatever that time period was. And, and I did the same thing. And I, I had a little period where I was home, studied writing for a while and did some writing from home. And it just, I, I really was struggling to balance that stay at home dad, writer dad <laughs> uh, balance um, until finally I went back to work. I was like, okay, I, it's just not working. Nobody's interested in what I'm writing. And so I guess I'll go back to work and, and maybe one day. And uh, yeah, finally getting that getting to that point where finally was like, Hey, you know what? I realize I've got time in the morning when I've been uh, watching the DVR or playing video games. Like this isn't improving or, or moving me forward and pursuing my dreams. Um, maybe I could use this time. And that's when I finally started carving away at what I wanted to do. And it, it helped finding out that I was going to be a grandpa that really gave me that kick in the butt. Like, Whoa, I got to move here. This is not supposed to be, I'm supposed to be a published author and all that by now, but I, I really appreciate that responsibility that you put forth in taking care of your family for so long before finally following your dreams. And I, I applaud that. I, I think there's a lot of people who would not either follow their dreams or uh, would not, you know, do the responsible things. I think that's, that's really great of you. So now whenever you were preparing and, um, learning the process and writing your novels did you plot them out or did you pants them i think it was a combination of both mm -hmm. uh, you know i 
I was set up, uh, you mentioned in one of the things I heard you being interviewed that you use Scrivener and I do as well. My older sister was a writer and she turned me on to Scrivener and I really liked it because as a writing tool, it allowed me to structure all these chapters and look at it away versus a file structure in another word processor. And um, so I, I started doing that kind of thing. And then I did an Excel spreadsheet that matched the Scrivener. And I looked at word count and things like that. So I always had a sense of balance and where the weight is in the, it, it, as I was doing the panster side of it and adding up pages. And it also gave me some intermittent reinforcement um, where, uh, you know, when you try to achieve uh, or acquire any kind of craft or skill, it's really important to get that hey, I'm getting it. Hey, I'm getting it. You know, I like that was a good <laughs> yeah. one. You know, the first hundred stunk, like uh, shooting a basketball or um, whatever your pursuit is, casting, going back to bass fishing. And then you go, wow, I, I that was great. I want to see if I could do that again. And then three hours go on and you don't do it again. But, you know, you're, you're reinforced <laughs> enough to want that adrenaline rush or that endorphin hit or whatever it is. So um, those are the little tricks that I use to just keep me focused on the project, being able to see the project grow, even though I was kind of jumping between Plotster and Panster and, and all that. Since changed as I went, as I got to know the people that I was writing about, the characters became more fleshed out. You know, and the story was about them. The premise is usually the clever thing you think you're so, you're, you're on to or what you want to do that differentiates your, your story or what have you. But then you have to move into showing it through humans and human interaction and uh, that's, that's what I love anyway. I write family sagas, which <laughs> I'm not sure there's a huge market for, but we'll talk about the market <laughs> in a minute. That, that for me as an old business guy, it was the first thing I did was look at it. I go, what is this market? What is this business all about? What are the numbers? Those kinds of things. And that mm -hmm. was extremely sobering, extremely sobering, which was good. And that reinforced that I had made the right decision as a, as a young guy, not to uh, focus on a craft I had uh, you know, no, no skills at all um, and go off and be a starving artist as a, as a young, young uh, um, a person in my 20s. And so I look back and I go, that was, that was a good move because making money at this thing is really difficult. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of people, the, the writers that I have come to know, uh, they supplement their income. Um, they teach, my, my writing teacher has written 17 novels at least. I think you might have an 18th out and a book on writing. Um, and I think he's a very good writer and a wonderful teacher. Um, and he has to take on guys like me. <laughs> and he taught, he taught me so much, uh, but he, he um, um, still has to do that. So I think there's very few that are in the mega bucks that um, you know, really are able to support themselves 100% on writing in the lifestyle that they want, taking care of their families, doing all the stuff we talked about already. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's pretty awesome too, that you found an outlet um, or somebody that you could rely upon that, that uh, took you under their wing and helped show you the ropes, helps formulate how you wanted to write and how to do it. That, that was a huge help for me is for me, it was like a group when I found my local writing group that finally informed me and and showed me okay here's how you're gonna get past the mushy middle and finally get to that because i always have an ending i don't know what the deal is i always have an ending and i'm writing to that ending um and sometimes i'm trying to figure out well how do i get there how do i start from there okay i've got a starting now but then how do i get from the start through the middle to this big ending that i have imagined in my head and uh finding that group just like your 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 teacher that helped me a lot and uh, I, enough cannot be said for our, uh, our mentors out there and, and those that are willing to take us under their wings and, and help us out because there's, there's plenty of authors who are much more secretive and much more like, well, I, I just have my process and that's, I'm, I'm going to stay in my room. <laughs> as long as their shelves lined with pulsers, I guess they were right. <laughs> that's true yeah, I, you know. I, the thing the thing and i, I want to plug this guy's name roland marullo um find him on amazon m-e-r-u-l-l-o um and he and i were born a few months apart i'm a few months older than him and we took different paths and we talked about that when we first started and i gave him the same story i gave you about wayne kennedy and 
and uh, the farm, my farm, not wanting to be a starving artist and all that. And he wanted to be a writer. So he did all kinds of, became a carpenter, did all kinds of um, interesting things to put money on the table, started a family, really a, a commendable guy and wrote and wrote and wrote and learned and learned and taught and taught. Um, but what I found was he was a teacher, an editor and a coach. And those three things together were phenomenal because just like a coach, if you've played sports or had children played sports, you've just been around it. Um, that you, you wonder why are they knocking this person down? It's because they believe he can do it. Why are they not giving them a hard time? Because they've been through too much. They need a break. You know, they just have a sense of how to motivate while still encouraging you to take the next step, take the next step. Cause at the end of the day, the book stands on its own. We can come back to a conversation you had on one of the, um, I think it was Spilling Ink podcast about, I think it was Katie Salidas made a comment about Stephen King's name on the cover. The print of that is as large or larger than the title. So his oh, name yeah. is selling the book. And I thought, wow, the beauty of, right, of a piece of art is that should stand on its own. But that's not the world we're in. That's not the industry. So much like the old thing you're, you're High school teacher would tell you, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, of course we do. Yep. <laughs> and then I think the thing that's most scary about doing podcasts, and this is my first podcast in this space, is don't judge a book by its author. Well, of course they do. You know, if Stephen King's got a new book out and he's got millions of fans. They've got the pre-order for the hardcover, you know, already set. Just send it to me as soon as you get it. Or I want to download it on my, my reader e-reader as soon as you get it. Um, and I'm thinking, wow. So if I, uh, if you use a pseudonym, if Stephen King uses a pseudonym, people won't be lining up for the, who's that, that person, you know? Um, and yet same brilliant writer, Stephen King is writing, writing that book. So I, I, that's one of the things in the industry I find really interesting because the art itself is uh, just part of the puzzle and who the person is that's offering it. I have a, a book, I, I don't know if I should even mention the name of it. It's just a great book that I love. Somebody recommended it to me years and years ago. And I couldn't understand why it was, I hadn't heard of it before. Then I found out this person had political views that really just turned off a huge swath of the, of the reading public. I went, oh, well, that makes sense. But boy, he wrote a great book. <laughs> you know, like, that was, <laughs> I mean, none of the politics oozed out of the book. There was nothing like that. But, um, you know, he had a presence a public presence that dissuaded um, readers. And I thought, this is really fascinating because you are judging it by the source. You're judging it by the writer. So as, as you become known, like somebody like you, who's got a presence, you do the podcast, you're connecting with other indies all over. I, and I thought, this is fascinating watching Jason move around because I watched two <laughs> podcasts where you were a guest. And then I listened to one where uh, like, like today, it's the, the my ski moment is, is you're interviewing somebody like me and having a conversation with me. So I find it just really fascinating. It's so different from the world that I came from, um, which were, uh, which was a, a world that was quite defined um, by entities and customers and motions that are very, very different than this industry. So I, I still scratch my head on, on uh, the publishing industry and would love to hear your thoughts as well as we dive into this. Well, and I tell you, it's, it's such an interesting industry in that we're, we're it's a solitary industry so so we start off all alone at our desk with our thoughts and paper we got to put it all down and there's you know nobody around maybe we have a tutor or you know a, a writing coach helping us out you know here and there but then once the book is done we're expected to okay now break out of that and announce it to the world and go everywhere and talk about it it's such a direct opposite of how <laughs> how we were for however many months or even years writing that book and then you got to do a, a 180 and hey everybody in the around the world i wrote a book and it's it's diametrically opposed to how a lot of authors are are built yeah the and, uh, how they've developed over time yeah and uh i mean that interesting. you say it's a it's a solitary lifestyle writing mm-hmm it's a team sport publishing. Yeah. It, even though if, if you're an indie, it's, it might be a team sport where you're the only one that bought shoes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you 
you're the only one that's got cleats on or whatever, you know, it's like, I'm ready. And then, you know, you're kind of going into the sands. People are, are talking, hey, can you help me with this game? You know, it's, like, it's really fascinating how, how unusual it is. And that's why I actually took a different approach. Like I, I really wanted to talk to you about self-publishing and um, you know, the, the, the stratification of the classic publishing industry from traditional publishing all the way down to van, what I'll call vanity presses, which, you know, serve a purpose. They mm -hmm. print whatever you send them, but they don't edit it. I mean, if you send them a copy of the phone book from your, your hometown and put a cover on it with your name on it, they would print it. Um, so, you, you know, that's what you're getting with that service. So I tried to see where are the services in this industry. And so many of them are people that are writing that will offer their services at a fee to help you. And then what you have found is community that helps each other. It's, and it's not, it's, it's not that you're being generous and doing something philanthropically, you're scratching somebody's back, they're scratching yours, you're helping each other build community and then build momentum for all of your offerings and then let the reading public get exposed to that. That seems to be the, the biggest challenge and what I've observed folks like you um, pursuing it in that way, where I took a middle of the road approach um, and pursued hybrid publishing after hearing about it and reading about it and meeting a publisher from one of the presses who is now my personal coach has, has, has taken over the role of my writing coach and is bringing this first book to market um, uh, with me. And it's, it's a different model because it's author financed and I was really like, is this just a vanity press? Is this just, uh, I, I send them my crap and they put a cover on it. Then you realize, no, it isn't because they have to select you uh, or your work as being worthy for their, their imprint, for their press. And they accept less than 10% of what's sent them. So I go, mm -hmm. okay, well that kind of passes my filter. Cause Jason, what I wanted when I was, when I started out with this, cause I knew as a retired guy, I had taken care of my family, I'd taken care of my retirement. I have modest needs and I could see the runway uh, for the rest of my life. I've got five grandkids. I want to have fun with them. I don't want to go, grandpa's busy being a tortured artist. It doesn't have time <laughs> and an ice cream and none. You know, so I have this really lovely situation where I get to be with these new people, these little kids, and then go off and write. And they, they affect me as much as any of my life experiences, these new experiences of watching the world unfold in front of a new person. So it's, it's just, I'm in a very, very good situation. And yet I look at the industry and think, this is, this is really messed up. <laughs> this is really a messed up thing. And not that anybody's doing anything evil. I don't think that's all. It's an evolution of the industry and art, but it's really different than it was even, you know, uh, in the middle of the, of the uh, 20th century. It's a totally different industry now. Well, it, totally. it really is, yeah. That's hyperbole. It's not totally, but it's big. it's different. Well, and I, I think it has changed a lot, especially over the last year uh, with uh, with the COVID um, that happened. I mean, because bookstores really took a hard hit. You know, it's really sad yeah. to see. But at the same time, in, in, and it depends on who you listen to. Bookstores and the sales are down. Uh, the book industry, they say, was doom and gloom. It was going to go the way of movies and, uh, you know, it can't survive. But indie authors were thriving uh, throughout it. They did, you know, very, very well. Uh, so it just kind of depend on, on who you were listening to or which what article you were reading. So, the, and I found that to be interesting, you know, not, not to say that one way was right or wrong. Uh, and it's good to see that they're both still doing well now that uh, the uh, traditional is coming back and, and there's some more bookstores starting to reopen. I, I love seeing that because no matter what, you know, even though I'm, I'm very much an indie. I enjoy the control of, of uh, you know, I get to choose my covers. I get to choose how, you know, what my voice is going to be if I'm going to tell my story my way. And I, and I think that's part of, goes into your example of uh, the direction that you go, whether you're going with, you know, one press or another or a vanity or self-publish. It's, are you telling the story that you want to tell? And I, I could not find a home previously because it was, my first book was very odd, you know, it was a urban legend kind of thing. And then it's very geographically intended. Uh, so people in that area of Missouri knew it outside of Missouri, don't really know it. And that's fine, you know, but it, but it was my passion project. It opened the door for me to get into writing. 
And uh, who knows down the road, maybe I'll, I'll be able to sell a book to, to a house somewhere. But along the way, I'm enjoying the control of it right now. Now, maybe in time, um, you know, like I said, I would love to sell to a house and kind of take a step back and be like, yep, you all take care of that part of it. And, and then I'll be happy to talk about it later on. It just kind of depends on uh, the path you're comfortable with, I think, in that time. I think it, it also to, to your, your points there, it, you know, you look at your own life journey and you say, where am I on this, uh, you know, this uh, three, three score and 10, you know, the 70 year track. That, <laughs> yeah. You know, they used to say, that's what you got. Well, I'm, I'm less than two years away from it. So <laughs> I looked at this, I said, okay, I took a different approach, um, you know, build a career outside of writing. I didn't know anything about writing. Um, but it was a pipe dream. And then uh, delay that to when I didn't need to rely on it for income and the pressure to create art for money. And that really affects, to your point, your voice and the project and telling it the way you want. And I, I, this sounds really hokey, but I actually said this to um, you know, every coach I've had or every person that's helped me out along this thing. I want this to be something that I've created with your help teaching me the craft, not with your um, words. I don't want you fixing this. I want you fixing me. I want you to teach me. I want you to coach me. I, you don't go to the plate and hit. I go to the plate and hit. Um, but at practice, you can show me how to swing it better and all that good stuff. So <laughs> that, was, that was the approach I took. And I, you know, right now, I've got this debut novel and I'm supposed to kick into this gear that, you're, that you've talked about. And you are absolutely 100% correct. And I probably won't do it. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the reason is I've got five wonderful grandkids that live fairly close to me. Um, I have uh, worked hard to grant myself the luxury of writing and granting myself the burden of marketing and selling and you know, knocking on uh, bookstore doors, I actually didn't want that. I want, I, I didn't want that. And I still don't want that. And it's like, people say, well, that's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. And I go, I think you're correct. But to me, it was much like in business. We come out of an academic setting. We're having the answer. And you might've been the kid up in the right-hand corner of the desk in, or right-hand corner of the room in class with your hand up and always had the right answer. Um, but that doesn't work in life. Um, having the ha, being correct is where you, where you start to say, I feel like I'm correct. Now, are you effective? Are you having a conversation that's turning any heads, um, changing any minds, or are you just, you know, crossing your arms and being correct? So for me, I think all the industry, especially the, the Indies, when I listen to um, colleagues like you talk about your journey and all that, I think that's, that's really a hard journey. <laughs> that's, that's, you're not writing, you know, you're doing this and that, but that's what it takes. So you are correct in pursuing it. And I looked at it like, I wanted to write a book that at the end, I could step back and say, I'm happy with that. I'm mm -hmm. happy with the craft that I've acquired. It's not, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you're never going to be that writer that had the classical um, uh, education and if you read, read uh, writing coaches or, or um, guides like John Gardner, who passed away at a young age, but he actually talked about if you don't have this education, you cannot create this kind of art. It's impossible. And I thought, OK, I'm not going to pursue that kind of art. So I lowered where my head was and really focused in on writing what I wanted to write, but to achieve the craft to write at that level so that I was comfortable handing it off to my my kids and my grandkids and saying, this is what grandpa wrote. And I'm, I'm happy with it. I hope it, I hope you drift off in the story and enjoy it and think that's cool. Grandpa wrote that book. How cool. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where I am. I've, I've written four novels. I've got two that are, um, well, one is, is being published in September. It's, it's now we're through the arcs and, and it's going to the print uh, stage. Um, and then I've got one that's um, uh, I actually was working on um, uh, for four years uh, and I put uh, the sorting room off on the shelf and I came back to um, the sorting room after I 
since um, uh, my latest book in for evaluation and the publisher, this is Spark Press, and the woman's name is Brooke Warren, uh, Warner, excuse me, Brooke Warner. And uh, she, she sent that second book right into copy editing. She goes, you can go get this copy edited and uh, you know, trim it up, do a couple things, you copy editor will help you. And then I sent her this book, which I hadn't touched in four years. This is over five years, or this is a year ago, beginning of the pandemic. And I said, I just want to know what your reaction is to this book. So I, I had her do a manuscript review. And this stuff costs money. So this is what <laughs> I saved my retirement for, to be able to, to have a really brilliant person who's in the industry read it and go, eh, nah, or hey, this is pretty good. You need to do some work on it, but it's pretty good. Well, she liked it, but it was packed with rookie errors. Um, I'll give you an example. So it's, it starts out in 1928. And a lot of these, the folks, the characters are uh, lower class. They're sons and daughters of immigrants. You know, there's broken English. There's a, so I wrote this first thing with dialect or, that was out of this world. Oh. You're not <laughs> yeah. supposed to do it. And I talked <laughs> yeah. away at this. For, and my writing coach, when I sent it to him, and he, was, he just took me on. He goes, you know, yeah, you're not supposed to do that, but it worked. It actually works. And then I realized, Hey, you know, my sister's not even going to read this thing. Uh, it's too hard. <laughs> it's just too hard to get the. It's like learning music and then, um, uh, you know, thinking you know what you're doing, and then hearing somebody do jazz fusion. So I sent her this book full of all the rookie errors, all the diction, everything else, um, and she came back and said, "I like it, but you need to rewrite it." So I, def I this sounds really weird. I haven't even opened up the file with the copy edits for the first book I sent in to copy editing and it's been finished for over a year and I haven't opened it up because I'm monomaniacal and I pivoted to this book, the sorting room. And it was on, had a different working title. And I, I worked, I did 5,000 pages a week and said it, sent it to my coach Brooke. And, and then she would, she would come back and say, this, this stinks. This is, <laughs> you fixed this. And I would work on that. And then I'd send her those pages and 5,000 more new pages. And so I rewrote the entire book during the pandemic. And then we went through and then she handed it off to uh, uh, a copy editor who went through it. I've learned so much just from these brilliant people who did what I didn't do, who studied this, who then worked in the industry, who built craft, not only as writers, but more importantly, as editors and as marketeers. So at the end of the day, I felt I learned so much from focusing. And this sounds really it's not arrogant. It's just a way of learning. I focused on my own words. Um, I, when I first got my writing, uh, uh, first writing teacher, I told him, I don't want to do exercises. I, I, I'm too old. I, you know, I just want, <laughs> I want somebody to point out to me what's wrong with what I'm doing because yeah. I had read all these books, Jason, and I continued to make mistakes that were called right out in the books that I could see in reading other novels. Like, well, that's problem, that's problem, that's problem. And I couldn't see it in my own words. And of course that makes perfect sense, right? You don't, you exactly. the center of the universe, so you can't see that pinpoint that you are. And my, the first teacher, Roland Marullo, he, he made a comment to me that was really an, uh, caused an epiphany. He said, inside a writer's mind, it all makes sense. When you put that pen down or turn off the, the keyboard, you go, I got this. It makes sense from beginning to end. It really makes sense. And then you hand it to somebody else and they start showing logic breaks, time sequence problems, you know, characters, <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And yeah. so that's the most important thing is just the, the humbling that goes through. And it's, you know, humbling and humiliation have a lot of common ground. The Venn is a pretty big overlap. And you have to open yourself up to that. I'm consciously incompetent. I want to learn and become consciously competent. And maybe someday, someday I'll just write with conscious competence. But I am really far from that. Uh, I still slide into the unconscious incompetence. Like I'm running around <laughs> just being wrong and I don't even know it. <laughs> I'm in the process right now of, of doing my rewrites and editing on my third book. And I keep finding things towards the end of the book that I forgot to mention earlier on. Little things like that, that my wife is really good at picking up and usually I'll hand it off to her when I'm done and she will pull out the red pen and just beat me up 
uh, showing me what I did wrong. And, and I love it. It's, it. I'm Thankfully, I've got the thick skin where I can take it and be like, okay, yeah, no, you're right. And uh, just like one of my favorite comments on dialect, when you were talking about that, one of my favorite comments I ever heard about dialect was somebody defending the writing saying, well, I just write how people speak. You know, that's what Mark Twain did and it works for him. And the comment from the pro was, but you're not Mark Twain. Right on. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. gosh. <laughs> well, and I don't know if you've ever seen uh, transcriptions of conversations like from work or anything else where they've recorded something and how people actually speak and then you yeah. actually read it. It is a dog's breakfast. Oh and how gosh. we speak, we are able to filter so many things out especially if you're there talking to the person, you're seeing them eye to eye, um, you forgive an awful lot because the communication is more than the word coming out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. um, they used to talk about this in public speaking, um, that uh, the content is less than 15%, 10 to 15% of the message that comes across in a, in a public speaking environment. The content, what you're there to talk about, it's not even a quarter of the message that gets across because people are mammals. <laughs> And we're picking so much stuff up from the speaker and from the other audience. If somebody cringes next to you and you didn't cringe, you go, wow, what was wrong with, what, what did they say? <laughs> what did they say? <laughs> oh, they just talked about something really nasty. Oh, I missed that. You um, know, something about that that occurred to me recently was how much more I prefer to just talk to somebody rather than texting. Um, I'll text. I, I text plenty. But if I've got something I really need to say, or if I really need to discuss something, I'm going to call because I've noticed, like you said, reading a text can have so many incantations and so many, you know, somebody could be in the middle of something and read this completely wrong. And then it's, what the hell did you mean by that? I'm like, I'm just asking, what are you doing later? You know, something along those lines. And like, well, are you asking me to dinner? Are you asking if I have plans or what are you asking me? And, and it's, it's, our writing is so much like that. It's, you've got to have the right, uh, the right words for what you're trying to get the thoughts out. And for me, one of the things that's helped me out is printing off sections. After I feel like I've got it done, I will print it because, and I, I learned this like two years ago, Science has shown that what we see on our computer screen is different from a written word. So if you yeah. print it off and then you read it out loud, you're guaranteed to find a lot of errors. And you're like, whoa, what the heck did I mean by this? And then you can go back through. And that's for self-editing. You know, if you're going to do that uh, before you hand it off to the, to the uh, editor or, or anybody else down the road. But it, it's just a little trick I've learned that has definitely helped me a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I think the reading out loud especially... Um, one of the things my um, first teacher taught me, and um, I thought it was really comforting because I thought, God, am I just dumber than a post? <laughs> this stuff's taking me a long time. <laughs> and every time I read it, I go, oh, how did that stay in there? How did I not see that before? And the first point that I already mentioned was, in the author's mind, it all makes sense. But uh, this whole thought of reviewing your words and I think you got to get another set of eyes on it of course like your wife is great you've got somebody who's a, a real critic not just a reinforcing um, person who loves you and says yeah keep going Jason I believe in you and that's all important but mm -hmm. you also need to say it's not spelled that way Jason yes <laughs> <laughs> you go, dude stop that um, and that is uh, what Roland taught me was you know probably does 10 complete rewrites of the book that he's doing. And he looks at his words at least a hundred times. And I thought, wow, that's that I've reflected on that years have gone by now. And they can certainly with the sorting room, um, I'm, I'm past even that because I'm still a novice. I'm, you know, I, I stopped calling myself a writing student uh, because I'm now putting a book out there, but I've been a writing student for a long, long time, still learning, um, but need to take that next step. I couldn't have done that with what I would call the Mozart approach, which is write it down once, it's perfect. I don't know if that exists in writing. It's different. And it mm -hmm. really does take that solitary lifestyle and that self-examination uh, of your words and, and then getting somebody like your wife does for you to just pull out that red pen and go, not yet. It ain't working. You're not there yet. 
Um, and that's okay. As long as you trust the source is on your side and they are on your side. It's just, it hurts so much. You go, oh, <laughs> oh. oh. And, then, and then you go, you're attacking me. Actually, no, I'm just attacking the words. I'm attacking what, what you put in front of me to read as a reader. You know, exactly. that's, what to do. that's what I want. Just rip it apart because it'll be better and you'll be more satisfied with the book when it's gone through that. And right now, whether this thing sells or not, I'm, I'm satisfied that with the help that I've gotten, I've learned the craft to the point of being able to deliver something to the world that uh, maybe very few people in the world might read it, but I feel really great about um, the construction of it. Um, I like reading it, <laughs> you know, and that's self gratifying, <laughs> I guess. And I know a lot of authors, they just move away from, they never reread their words because they want to re-edit it and all that kind of stuff. And frankly, I want to enjoy the fact that this is something I worked very hard for and did delay gratification. And then it took um, you know, probably, it was a decade and a half of, uh, of working away, trying to learn stuff and uh, construct something that I, I believe in. And that's good. That's good. I'm, that's the important thing for all, all of you listeners out there, all you beginning authors out there who are struggling to finish that first book. If you're enjoying it, that's important. So just write it and get it done, get it to somebody who can check it out. And as long as you are loving that book, it's going to come across in the words that you're writing. And uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely, but as much fun as I'm having here with everything <laughs> else, we should talk about the sorting room. Uh, we, we talked a little bit, or you touched on it here a moment ago. Everybody, this is his debut novel that's, that's coming out. It's not your first novel, but it's your debut one. Uh, the Sorting Room, it's a prohibition era uh, that takes place in New York City, an epic family saga about a captivating tale of a woman's struggle and perseverance in faint hopes of reconciliation, if not redemption. Tell us about the inception here. How did this, uh, tell us a little bit about it and how this came to be. So like with a lot of things in life, you, um, in writing rather, you pull things from your own life. Um, I'm not autobiographical, uh, which I know from reading about writing, a lot of people uh, go to that, but I am pulling life experiences or experiences from other people that I've met. So um, a couple of things, first of all, I grew up on a dairy farm and <laughs> as a farm kid, I was probably, I probably had a weaker stomach than most farm kids. Um, so the smell is like, Ugh. <laughs> but you know, you, you, you learn to live with it. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I can handle this stuff, you know, uh, moved a lot of cow maneuver around all that. And when I was in high school, I actually got a, a, a job at the local uh, laundry plant, laundry and dry cleaning plant where they did industrial um, uh, jobs for nursing homes and hospitals and things like that. And I actually, when I, when I asked people, I used to do this kind of as a just a thing talking to people about, tell me your most disgusting job that you ever had. And it's really tough to top the sorting room. Um, and I didn't work in the sorting room full time, but I would go in and uh, with overflow or on the weekends when the um, guys like me were working, um, cause I worked the weekends as well as a few hours during the week, but um, you'd have to go into the sorting room sometimes. And you're sorting uh, nursing home and hospital linens and a lot of times uh, the diapers were still in the, in the hospital linens and the nursing home linens, and you'd have to sort those out. And it was pretty intense. I didn't grow up nursing. Uh, I didn't grow up with all this. And it just stuck in my head about, you know, how, this in, the, how that industry worked because you take things that are quite compromised, <laughs> right? And then mm -hmm. you deliver them back clean, folded, ironed, all that kind of stuff and packaged. And it's like transformed. Well, the transformation process, like a lot of industries, meat packing, what have you think of Sinclair Lewis. And, and some of these things are really difficult. So that's how I, I kind of got this in my head. Now that was in the sixties where, when I worked in a laundry. So this is, uh, you know, I'm projecting back and, and all this. And then I thought of, um, you know, the, the, the character Eunice, Eunice Ritter, who's a little girl who gets a job in the sorting room at 10 years old. And she has alcoholic parents, families pretty dysfunctional, as you can imagine. And, uh, but she's a real go-getter and goes and just 
you know, won't go away and finally gets this job. And it's about how this transforms her life because she actually makes a friend in there. She has really no, really no friends and not a lot of nurturing from home. So she's a tough little street urchin. And then the woman who is in the sorting room full time, a woman named Gussie, becomes her friend and mentor. And the story kind of goes from there as, as Eunice's life unfolds and personal issues happen. All kinds of tough things happen because of the, uh, the class that she was in. Um, and it's her life. And the first part of the book is 60% of the book all happens here in or there in New York City. And then, uh, you know, a, a situation happens where she needs to leave. New York City, and she moves upstate to the neck of the woods I grew up in, up, upstate New York. Um, and that's the, uh, so the, the book jumps from when this thing happens to her as a very young adult. Uh, she goes, so she goes from 10, works in the laundry, all the way up to when she's about uh, 19 or 20, and then she needs to leave. So she picks up and moves to upstate New York, gets another job in a laundry, but the um, second part of the book opens up decades later with one of her children and his family, and they're going to see her on Mother's Day. So the second part of the book is sequential Mother's Days over several years, because it's the only time he's ever seen his mother as, as he grew up, because he was illegitimate. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the thing that forces her out of, of New York City. Um, and this, uh, the illegitimacy is interesting because again, this is not a character study on just Eunice. And I think if somebody picks it up and goes, I love reading about a character all the way through. Well, this is a family saga. So it's about Eunice and her family, but I introduce characters. Um, uh, one comes from an Indian reservation in Northern Idaho. And um, he's a young man that's going on his own with called Solo Journey, and he ends up in New York City, and he becomes a critical character in her family life down the road and comes back in the second part. So the, the, what I love to do is I love to show um, the different people that some people say, well, that's all backstory. Yeah, I love, I love that. But it's the, that's why it's a family saga. You're telling about these people when they were younger, what happened to them. And how it transforms into, you know, a, a family situation that then you project decades forward and you see what had been what has been wrought, and that's how the the, the last part of the book, the last forty percent of the book unfolds. Oh my gosh! Well, I mean, it's been called uh, deeply moving. Like I said, the Prohibition era, following this whole family. There's so much going on and uh, so much drama. This it sounds incredible. This is available right now for pre-order and it's coming in September. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. September 21st. Wonderful. Okay. Not well, that I'm fixated on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, uh, what are you working on next? What's, uh, what's next for you? Well, I, um, like I said, I had that, I mentioned I had the book that I had spent uh, four years on before going back and dusting this one off. And um, so I, I actually have got to make a decision. Do I crack open the copy out of that and throw myself into what will be a six months project? I'm sure just getting it ready to um, see if it's, um, you, know, uh, you know, ready to be published, which I think it will take me six months to clean it up because that's, it's a big book. It needs to be reduced. It's over hundred thousand words. So it needs to get under hundred thousand. And I think that's doable. Um, so I can do that, and I love that book. Um, but I've got one, my, th my third book um, that I would publish. Again, I don't think I'll go back to the other ones I wrote before. They were such amateurish and merely kind of hack jobs. But I've got one that I've spent a lot of time conceptualizing, doing the, the, uh, the plotster side of things. And um, like any writer, that's the fun part, is getting in and starting a new project. So I may, after getting Sorting Room published, I'm, I may uh, try to do both, but I'm pretty sure, Jason, if I crack open that, that book that I worked on for years, I will be just lost in it for a good six months to a year. And I really feel like I, 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 I don't know what to do, whether I should do that, because <laughs> there's something real there. 
if I, if I thought this is the only way I'm going to be able to pay my mortgage, there'd be no debate. I would just go to that book and, and just get it ready for the market and focus on working that. Yeah. But again, given the you know, approach I took toward the writing life, I also think I can get this other book out, which is more timely and may have more of a speculative fiction approach than either of the two books that I've, I've been working on uh, so far. And that just intrigued me because a lot of my early influence uh, were speculative fiction writers and, and uh, things that just can't happen. So I would like to play with that, even though it's a family saga, but with this little uh, pre-dystopian twist in it that I think is timely given our, given our um, current situation on the planet. So it'd be fun. It, it also uh, allows me to vent some of the things that I am passionate about without being pedantic and just having observations by the characters who, in this case, uh, the main character is a person that's pretty broken by personal tragedy. And then, you know, facing all the things of, of, of life that are coming at us now while dealing with younger people, which is good for me because I'm dealing with a lot of younger people now. In fact, most of the people I deal with are younger. <laughs> the, the writer's life, I tell you, trying to figure out which story to go with next and which one to stick with and like oh well this is like you said this one's more timely but my heart's in this one and which way do i go oh my gosh it's a never-ending drama yeah and you know the biggest the most important self-talk talk for i think all writers but <clears throat> certainly for me because i think if if you're writing to make money if you're writing to replace your career with a new career the pressure, the professional pressure on that is like any career switch. Um, and that's, that's a big deal. And I think a lot of, of writers are in that situation. And I look at this very much like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I get to be at the highest stage, which is self-actualization. I'm doing something I crave to do, to immerse myself in. And I really wanted to be unencumbered doing that. And that's not the case for most writers. So I realize how fortunate I am that I worked really hard, delayed gratification on this thing. And now this is something I'm very industrious, very passionate about, put a lot of work into. And I always remind myself, this is what you wanted. This is, this is what feeds you now. Um, and you already bought your popcorn with, <laughs> with, you, with what you saved for retirement. So go make, a, go make some popcorn. Thank your, your, uh, your, your career, your history, your bosses, your colleagues, all the people that made you successful. Um, they're paying your mortgage, but you cannot complain. I tell myself, you cannot complain. This is what you wanted. I get to do something that very few people on the planet get to do, do what they want. Oh my gosh, I, I agree completely. Very well said. Michael, where can people find and follow you? Um, they can uh, certainly find me on Amazon. And they can find me on my webpage, Michael Rose, author, all one word, dot com. Uh, it's pretty sparse. It shows the sorting room. And I'd say the, the one thing on there that uh, might be fun and might trigger your interest is the book club questions. And I tried to do those. And I don't know if, if you've done that, Jason, or, or others. I looked at your website. Um, and I, I was debating about that and I thought, you know, I really think this is a book club book and I would love to hear people, um, you know, respond. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in a book club and listen to them debate some of the questions I put out there and some of the things that are maybe stimulating for their discussion. So that's the one reason I'd really point people to the website because it could, it could say, yeah, that's an inch. I'd like to read that book. That's kind of cool. I don't know exactly what all this means because I've got to read these characters, but I like that. I, I like where it's going. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I really like that. Uh, the uh, the guide on here so you have everybody uh, checking this out. Of course, we're going to have the, all these links in the show notes. So you can just click that link there and go right to his website. But it's, it's fascinating to, to pull that up. And then it's uh, as you're reading through it, you can open up these questions and see what your thoughts are on each of these questions. And it's, uh, it's very unique. And uh, I think it, it adds another level to the book that I have not seen before. So this is really cool. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a wonderful chat. And uh, my gosh, yeah, I'm going to have to uh, follow you. And uh, we'll have to stay in touch because I, I look forward to 
your next book and uh, following your career. And uh, it seems uh, certainly like you've got yourself a, a wealthy career ahead of you. Well, Jason, thanks for your contribution um, to the community doing this. And I know it helps you with, with your books and your craft, but you also have a great approach on this. And uh, it's easy to chat with you. And that's so reinforcing to all of us in a community that uh, isn't exactly knitted together with a lot of contact. So it's, it's great to have this. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to chat with you today. It was great. A lot of fun. It, it was definitely great. Uh, definitely a lot of fun. And it was definitely all, all my pleasure. I, this has been wonderful. And uh, I, like I said, I seriously, I, I can't wait to follow along with the book and uh, follow along with your career. So this is, this is great, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, time for me to step aside. I'm going to relight my cigar. I'm having myself a little mint Java cigar today. <laughs> and uh, sit back as we listen to our sample chapter from Michael Rose with The Sorting Room. This is chapter one. He threw out the children and the odors on the hottest day along the eastern seaboard in the summer of 1928. Blasts from ship horns in New York Harbor rolled over the buildings and dropped into the alley that 10-year-old Eunice Ritter had entered with purpose. She was not an unwitting, innocent little girl who happened upon five older boys playing marbles in the dirt. Curiosity had not tempted her into their keep. Yesterday, when she'd finally gotten her chance, she had won her brother's prize shooter. Today, she was returning to finish what she'd started. Eunice's brother Ulrich, Uli, they called him, tried to chase her off, throwing a rock at her feet as she approached. She did not break stride as his missile sailed off target and bounded past her. Dismissing Uli with a smirk, she marched up to the boys who were competing for each other's class trophies. All of Uli she held in her own sack. Agitated by her presence, the swarm buzzed around the shooting circle they had scratched in the dirt. They had hand smoothed the pitch's interior to remove pebbles. Two boys knelt in opposition, their bodies tight with concentration. Beads of sweat broke free from rutted foreheads, threw lines down dirty faces and dropped from noses onto their field of play. With grimy wrists, the contestants wiped their eyes. Eunice waited to take on the winner, her cool calm raising the heat on her adversaries, increasing their perspiration. Uli's best friend, Gerald, won the round. He stood to unwind his legs and stretch his back. He did not gloat as was the custom after such victories. Wary of his next opponent, Gerald was silent as he rolled his shooter in his hand. Before Eunice knelt at the edge of the circle and tossed her marbles inside, she first scanned the crowd, freezing the boys one at a time with a personalized scowl. The high walls of the narrow alley trapped the stifling air like an empty metal box car left on a hot track under a midday sun. Her thin tattered dress gave Eunice a breezy advantage. She nodded at Gerald, then dug her bare bony knees into the grit. Unfazed by their attempts to distract her, in short order, Eunice cleared all but one of Gerald's marbles from the circle. A single glass sphere waited in the dirt to be claimed. Anxiety mixed with the thick air as the other four boys leaned over helpless. No one laughed. She paused for her final shot, relaxed and focused like a sniper timing a kill. Eunice released her thumb at the end of a slow breath and sent on its course her newest weapon, Uli's beloved shooter. After she heard the glass on glass clack, she lifted her gaze to watch Gerald's last marble roll across the miniature pitch. It hopped on first contact with the gravel waiting beyond the circle's perimeter, then skipped and spun to a stop. Your baby sister's a lot better with your shooter than you, Uli. Shut up, Gerald. Eunice rose into a squat, then rocked back and leaned on her right arm. The heel of her tight fist dug into the dirt. Uli's shooter cupped in her palm. She surveyed the stunned circle before she spoke to Gerald. Shoot for shooters? Without looking at her, he croaked out his refusal. Nah, you win. You took Uli's shooter yesterday. You ain't going to add mine to your collection. You sure you're a girl? It was not a novel taunt to Eunice. It was skinny, but strong, sinewy, and narrowed hip, often mistaken for a boy. She scooped up all the marbles she had bet. Gerald did not capture a single one of hers. Eunice then stood, rubbing the skin on her knees as she unfurled. Gerald sped open the mouth of his depleted marble bag and dropped a shooter inside. It made no sound when it landed at the bottom of the empty pouch. The last of Gerald's glass trophies dropped with a click onto the pile in Eunice's bloated leather sack. Uli's shooter followed, and with the drawstrings twisted around her right index finger, she pulled the bag closed. 
She flashed a victor's smile then raised and extended her arms into a V high above her head, squeezing the bulging pouch tight in her right fist. Yeah, she's a girl all right, Uli yelled as he lunged at her. Eunice felt his fist punch her gut. She doubled over and fought for breath, her face close to Uli's belt buckle. He scratched the back of her dress until he had two fists full of fabric, then pulled it over her head. He twisted the garment like a turban, trapping her arms at the shoulders. Uli forced her head down toward the alley floor. Blinded and suffocating, she pressed her bag into the ground to steady herself. She knelt, grinding her knees into the gravel. Uli leaned on top of her, surrounding her like a wrestler. He crushed his elbow into her ribs, and then Eunice felt him paw at the pouch. After she tugged it away from his grip, she reared back to buck him off, then stood, wobbling. She heard Uli snicker as he lost his hold on her headdress. Although he fell silent, she could sense him kneeling in front of her. Without warning, Uli slipped his index fingers inside the waistline of her exposed panties and pulled down hard. Her underpants crumpled at her ankles like cotton shackles. The boys heckled. She gasped, imagining them all staring at her nakedness. Eunice squeezed the bag of marbles as she stood gyrating to get her arms free. She kept her feet planted in place, knowing she would trip and fall over if she panicked. The boys spat out invectives that sounded to her like wishful incantations, frantic spells to prevent her escape. First things first, she thought, free the feet, then the arms. Up and down, she marched, alternating her steps upon the hot coals of their taunts until one foot slipped out. Panties in a loose bunch around a single ankle. She steadied herself and widened her stance for balance in order to fight her way out of Uli's swaddle. It was hard to breathe. She contorted her arms and shoulders like Harry Houdini. The boy's laughter grew quieter as the material slackened, releasing her arms. She took a hungry breath. Once the dress fell back into place past her hips, she pulled her other foot free from the dusty cotton leg cuffs. Still kneeling before, Uli looked up. She fumed, wanting to cow him in front of his friends. Elbows locked, hands clenching his thighs, Uli had left his head unproductive. She held the sack of marbles in a white-knuckled fist and brandished the spoils in his face. What are you going to do? You hit like a girl, Eunice, he said. Now give me back my shooter. It happened in a flash and felt instinctual unlike a skill acquired by countless hours of repetitive practice. Not until after she left the boys in the alley would she recall where she'd learned the move from Pa. We'd come home early one night, albeit drunk as usual. He'd rambled on to his children about fighting, about how to stop an attacker. He'd been holding a cold compress to his blackened left eye, the result of an altercation outside a speakeasy, as he said, when he comes at you, box their ears. Pa dropped his compress and wobbled over to where his son sat, mesmerized. Clapping cupped hands against Uli's head, Pa boxed his ears with intemperate force. Uli absorbed the blows and dropped off his chair and fell to his knees. He told Eunice later that a white light had blazed in his head when Pa clubbed him. For years to come, Eunice would marvel at the quickness of her reaction, fueled by fury. Without internal debate, she simply clenched her jaw and struck. An open hand slapped the right side of Uli's head, a sting apropos for the insult. The marble-filled pouch squeezed in her right hand, cudgeled his left temple. The blow left Uli lying in the dirt, unresponsive and bleeding from his ear, surrounded by his stunned friends. He would never be the same, nor would he ever torment his younger sister again. As far as Eunice could determine, he never thought to do so. Out on New York Harbor, a cargo ship blew its horn. The sound sailed past the water through the stale, humid air and drifted down to Eunice's ears. She tugged and twisted her dress at the weight line, then exited the alley, her posture erect. The leather sack, still bulging tight with marbles, relaxed in her hand. The panties she had stopped into the gravel, swung from her other hand on a loose hook formed by her pinky. Okay, that was Michael Rose reading a sample chapter from his debut novel, The Sorting Room. And I don't know about you, but Eunice sounds tough. Hey, the sorting room comes out September 21st, but you don't have to wait that long to order it. The pre-order is available right now. So click that link in the show notes to grab a copy for yourself. Don't forget to also follow Michael on Amazon and on his website. Those links are also there. You can also find links there for our podcast friends, sponsor, and partner alike. And hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next week when I am back with an all-new author, an all-new book, and a brand new sample chapter. Take care, everybody. We'll talk to you again very, very soon. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.